the aspiring apologists must study diligently. They've got to know a whole lot. Apologetics is a lot of fun, but it is hard work. Start picking a few areas that you're good in, and because you're not going to be able to master everything. So my advice to apologists is that, up and coming apologists, is that you don't um, try to just cover everything and answer everything because apologetics has uh, such a broad base that it could take a whole lifetime. Actually, it would be more than a lifetime. So what I would suggest that you do is you face whatever problem or whatever question is right in front of you. Uh, so who's that person that has a question? What is that question? There's where you can go deep and there's where you can spend your time is on that one thing. I would say one of the most important things is to prepare. Uh, that might be a formal degree, it might be a PhD. If you're going to go into higher education, you're going to be a professor, you're going to be doing other things. But a person has to pay the price to go into this. Get your education first, your formal education. Because I didn't know what I didn't know, and if I hadn't have gone through the formal program at Southern Evangelical Seminary, I wouldn't have learned what I needed to know to really try and be a good apologist. And so I think you need to get your education first. That doesn't mean you can't do some ministry while you're getting your education. You want to teach a Sunday school class or that kind of thing, you can. But don't advertise yourself as some apologist who's going out there and trying to take on the world. Get your education first, shun the spotlight as long as you can, and when you're ready, the teacher will appear. Focus on a, on a very serious academic topic like history or biology or chemistry and perhaps something you'll never get a chance to study later. You can pick up all that you need in apologetics later, but to get grounding in one of those fundamental academic disciplines is something I wouldn't trade for anything. And it's tremendous preparation because after all, apologetics is an interdisciplinary enterprise. What are you passionate about? What are you gifted with? Is it science? Is it biblical criticism? Uh, is it uh, archaeology? Whatever it is that you're interested in, excel at that. Become a scholar at that. Become the best there is in that field and then apply that to your apologetics. If you're an apologist, major in the majors. Don't major in the minors. Don't argue, as Paul would say, over meaningless genealogies. Stay on the basics. For me, that's truth, God, miracles, the New Testament. If you can show that truth exists, God exists, miracles are possible, and the New Testament's reliable, then Christianity is true. Leave it at that. Now, if you want to be a cultural apologist, you know there are big issues that are affecting the country. Yes, that's good too, but don't major in the minors. One thing that's been very helpful for me in my whole apologetics career is having studied all of the great world religions. There's some authority that comes with having studied those in a serious way because you can be an authority on doing the comparison and showing how Christianity can be a standout among the great world religious traditions. Four E's. Uh, evil, evolution, ethics, and eternity. If you can get good at dealing with those issues, evil, evolution, ethics, and eternity, then you're gonna be an effective apologist because 95% of the questions I get are in one of those four categories. If God, why evil? Why, why did God uh, uh, kill the Canaanites? Uh, is God evil? Those kind of questions. Ethics, questions regarding sexuality, homosexuality. Uh, even you can put the Canaanite question in that category too. Uh, evolution, if God, uh, or if evolution is true, what does that mean for Christianity? And of course, eternity, why did God, uh, uh, why would God send me to hell if I don't believe in Jesus? Or will he send me to hell if I don't believe in Jesus? What about those that have never heard? Why did God create people who knew would go to hell? Those are the kinds of questions, those four E's. If you get good at those four E's, you're gonna be effective. Something that I've, I've discovered in studying the world religions is that the resurrection of Jesus is a is a very powerful tool in the hands of the Holy Spirit. It cuts through that that weird spiritual fog like nothing else. So master some good, uh, hard, evidential arguments for the resurrection of Jesus because it really changes the discussion. Well, it's very important for apologists to listen to what the other person is saying, to honor them as a human being made in God's image and likeness, and to pray as they listen. What is the person's worldview? Is it deism, is it atheism, what is it? Or is it a combination of worldviews? And then to be able to ask questions based on what you hear. So you're not simply going in with an agenda, I'm going to give this argument and the other argument, but I will use the arguments that are appropriate to the person's worldview 
and also give them in a way that's appropriate to the person's way of communicating. And furthermore, knowing about their background will help you to present the material in a sensitive and kind way. So if people are burned by the church, that may be the main issue. It may not be whether or not there's a God. So you listen to them. What happened in your church? Why did it happen? Commiserate with people. Uh, pray for yourself that you have wisdom. Pray for the other person. God will open their mind. Apologists have a bad reputation for arguing rather than trying to provide evidence in a winsome way, evidence that really can bring people to Christ and help grow people in Christ. One of the things that we like to do as apologists is we really like to have all the answers and we like to prove that we're right. Uh, but that does not build relationship and sometimes that actually turns people off from you and they, they actually can't hear you because they're busy defending themselves because they've been put in a defensive stance. So one of the things that we want to do um, as apologists is we want to make sure and develop a relationship with people and provide an environment where they can be heard, um, where, their question, where they feel safe to give their question to you um, and then your dialogue can unfold from there. You need the arguments, but you need to be the kind of person that will be listened to. And you need to be the kind of person that will love your neighbor as yourself, as you do the apologetics. The gospel is not popular these days, and you will have opposition. If you are actually doing good work, people will come against you. Jesus tells us that. So my advice for an apologist who's thinking about entering into the field is Get some thick skin. Be ready to be criticized. Uh, be ready to handle that. It's difficult and when you get feedback you invariably focus on the one thing that was negative and even though you might have had thousands of positive comments, that one negative comment really sticks with you. Work that out of your system. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads people to the Lord. It's not our powerful arguments or me as such an awesome scholar. It's the Lord. You've also heard, often heard the adage, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's like Aristotle said, uh, to make a, be an effective speaker, you've got to have the ethos. You've got to be an ethical person. You've got to be a moral person. And since we are representing Jesus Christ and, and the body of Christ, we've got to be good examples or else we disqualify ourselves. I tell my students that so many times, especially for people who spend a lot of years in school, our head races ahead of our heart. I know what happened to me when I was in grad school. My head was way ahead of my heart. As a result, the doubts came. I wasn't uh, as grounded as well as I should have been. I had book knowledge, but I didn't know where I was personally with the Lord. I'd say there's no substitute for reading, for prayer, for worship, for fellowship, for practicing the disciplines. One quote that I like to give is from Ken Sandy. And he said that um, before we can give out the gospel, we need to have the gospel deeply woven into us. And I think that's an important part of apologetics is that we ourselves are deeply impressed and deeply transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the impetus. That's why we're going out and sharing with others. That's why we engage others and serve them is because of the gospel de being deeply woven into our own lives. I think about C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity who said, don't ever think that the Christian doctrines are going to stay in you even if you do nothing. You just think they're going to be there. They're not. They're going to dissipate. Cares of the life are going to come in. I think Jesus had a parable about that, right? Sowing the, the seed. We have to cultivate like a farmer does. We have to cultivate. We have to uh, water. We have to keep the weeds out. We've got to do that ourselves. And I think the walk with the Lord is so incredibly important. Something to remember if you're becoming an apologist is that it is one aspect of a well-rounded Christian life. Even the apologetics itself is best served as a tool for evangelism. If you're just doing apologetics, qua apologetics, uh, I don't think you'll reach many people. So you have to be a well-rounded Christian. Make sure your devotional life is robust. Develop a connection with the Lord. Lean on Him, trust Him, let Him speak into your life. Let your apologetics be fueled by reliance upon the Holy Spirit. Uh, engage in fasting and spiritual discipline. Do your daily devotions. Read the scriptures regularly. Let God guide you in all that. Your apologetics should be a result, an outflow of a robust Christian life.